On Tech News Today, we'll tell you what Microsoft unveiled at their Surface announcement today. Plus, we'll introduce you to the woman hired to run Apple's retail stores worldwide. We'll also check out Google's incredible new photo feature, and you won't believe why China just banned Windows 8. All that and more coming up right now. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, May 20th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Apple and Android devices are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. And I'm Jason Owl. Tech News Today explores the big stories of the day with some of the world's best journalists. Our guest co anchor today is Maggie Reardon, a reporter for CNET. Welcome, Maggie Reardon. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're just uh, 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 joking that you have a fake backdrop that looks like an office, and in fact, you're on the <laughs> beach. Uh, so right. good job to you. That's uh, that's the way to do it. So Yeah, you, c you can't see my margarita, which is off to the side. <laughs> that's, that's a good <laughs> idea. We'll try to catch you between, uh, <laughs> right. between when the camera's on you. So uh, you're in New York City, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, why don't we jump right into the news? Speaking of New York City, Microsoft announced some new goodies at a special event in, in New York. Ed Bott writes incessantly about technology and is the author of more than 25 books about Microsoft, Windows, and Office. He's joining us by phone from the announcement. Welcome, Ed Bott. Hi, Mike. Good to be here. So, um, Ed Bott, uh, now, of course, this, uh, this is a big announcement. We're expecting all kinds of things. We didn't get everything we were expecting. Uh, and so can you tell us uh, a little bit about this Surface Pro 3? This was uh, kind of rumored, but some of the details were surprising. So how is this different from the previous version of Surface of the Surface Pro? Sure. Well, this is version 3. Uh, so the Surface Pro came out in 2012. Last year, it was the Surface Pro 2. And this is Surface Pro 3. What's really different about this one um, is, first of all, the size and weight. It, this is much, much, much thinner than the previous editions of the Surface Pro and also much lighter. Uh, second, the hinge, which in the first edition had one angle that it clicked out to, and the second edition had two angles that it clicked out to. It's now a friction-free hinge, so you can literally extend it at any angle, including putting it back into what they call canvas mode, where it's just you know barely uh, flexed off of the surface that you're on, uh, so that it's you know just barely up at maybe a 10 degree angle. Uh, so that's a big deal. And then finally, it's a 12 inch screen instead of the 10.6 inch screens that have been on previous uh, devices, and at a three to two aspect ratio instead of the 16 to nine that they've been using, or the four to three that uh, an iPad user might be uh, comfortable with. So in other words, this is completely different. Uh, it sounds to me like it's completely different, at least from the user experience point of view. From a user experience point of view, there's a lot of difference to it. Uh, uh, you know, starting with the, I mean, just with the physical package alone, they tried to address, I think, a lot of the usability issues that um, the people had with it. I'm hearing some pretty amazing things about the, the stylus that goes with it. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's, uh, and, uh, and they will, um, uh, somebody from Microsoft will scream at you if you call it a stylus. It's a pen, they will tell you. Um, the stylus is usually just a pointing device, and this one has a lot of smarts in it. I'm actually holding it in my hand right now. One thing that's cool about it, it has a little button on the top, and if the machine is asleep, uh, you can just click the button on the top of it, just like you would with a ballpoint pen, and that will wake the machine up um, and start OneNote. You can also, if you are on uh, on a web page or you're pointing the uh, rear-facing camera at something, you can double-click the pen, and what that will do is is either take a picture of whatever is on the screen or whatever is facing the camera lens, and then it will drop that image directly into OneNote, where you can then select something and. Uh, choose to put that in OneNote as an image or as text. It will recognize the text and uh, and drop that in. Very, 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 very cool little pen, not a stylus. Now, I've seen some really interesting videos coming out of Microsoft research over the years 
that show a lot of innovation in, in terms of combining uh, pointing gestures, finger gestures, and pen gestures, and the use of a pen. Are any of those uh, new gestures or a new re uh, research coming out of that division uh, present in this in this uh, in the new version of Windows? Is this coming up? Are they going to actually integrate some of these uh, some of these research conventions that they've developed? They didn't show off any of those today, and my guess is that that will require changes to the software stack sometime in the future uh, for those to appear. But I think what you get here instead is something, you know, the, the old Surface Pro 2, if you tried to hold it uh, in your hand and use it as you would uh, a yellow legal pad to take notes on, it would be just a little too heavy uh, and a little too small for you to do that. So the different aspect ratio and the much, much, much lighter weight of it um, makes that scenario more viable. And as a result, you can... Um, there's, there's things that you can do with apps that recognize the pen capability, but you can also just take notes with it. And I've been doing that for years on it. I'm actually excited to be using this as a note-taking machine. Now, Microsoft called it, quote, the tablet that can replace your laptop, and I think they backed that up with some some demos. But this, uh, I think the previous, uh, all the Surface devices have been seen by the public as competitors to the iPad, but clearly this is a competitor to something like the MacBook Air, isn't it? They uh, they actually directly positioned it as a competitor to the MacBook Air on the stage when they were doing the event. They had a, a, a triple beam scale, the kind where you know you have uh, two little circular pads and you put one device on each one. And the Surface Pro 3 with the pen and the type cover on one scale and the MacBook Air 13 on the other scale, uh, the the, uh, the MacBook Air was, was much heavier. Uh, so, so yeah, they're they're positioning this as uh, you can use it as a tablet, but it's really a laptop replacement. And it does it does remain to be seen whether uh, the changes that they've made will be enough to convince people that this is something that they can you know that they, they can truly uh, do that with. Um, but this this certainly has the best shot. Just it's just in terms of size alone, uh, I think. It has the best shot of anything they've put out yet to uh, to really uh, fit into that same space as a MacBook Air 13. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Ed, if if you thought that this, you know, do you really think that they've they've kind of hit it this time in in terms of finding uh, a product that that can break into this category? You know, I mean, is is it kind of um, yeah, is this a smart move for them to go? against the MacBook Air than trying to compete against the iPad? Well, uh, yeah, you know, if you look at the, the data that I was seeing today and, you know, over the last couple of months, I think there was some new data today that shows that, you know, tablet sales are really slowing down um, and that tablet devices tend to be primarily consumption devices. So they've still got devices that you can use in that category, but I think their sweet spot is still business. Um, and a lot of the things that this device is optimized for, things like Photoshop, guy from Adobe was here showing off uh, a preview of their new touch optimized version of Photoshop. All of the office applications, those will be coming out in touch optimized versions later this year. Uh, so I think this is all about productivity. So in some ways, it's not so much a replacement for the iPad in and of itself, it's a replacement for people who, who might be trying to force the iPad into productivity scenarios. And they could say, well, okay, this is a more appropriate device. But, you know, all of the Surface devices that they've introduced, both the, the, the RT line and the Pro line, are, you know, they have this, this fundamental thing that, you know, people have to look at these and they have to accept just how different they are from either a conventional PC or something like uh, an iPad, which is you know a standalone touch-capable device that isn't really meant to be used with external peripherals. So it's it, they, they're really creating a new category, and it remains to be seen how many people are going to accept this category. Now, I had somebody named CR1, probably not their real name, uh, from San Clemente, California, is asking about pricing. What's the pricing on on this this line? 
Uh, you know, uh, Mary Jo Foley, my colleague, just posted uh, some of the details about this at ZDNet, so I'd encourage people to go look at that. I know the pricing starts at seven ninety nine. It has an Intel processor, i3, i5, and i7, different uh, storage capabilities and different peripherals. I think, you know, the, the 799 version is, is almost certainly the i3, and then you've got to pay another 129 bucks for a, uh, a type cover. So you're basically into the same price range as MacBook Airs are, which start at 899 and, um, and they can go up, you know, quite dramatically. Now, the other thing that's different about this from, a, from MacBook Air in terms of pricing, even though the pricing might be comparable, this has uh, basically retina resolution to it. So it's, uh, it's 20, I forget what the, what the uh, native resolution is, but, the, but it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a very high resolution screen that's then scaled to 1.5 in the same way that retina displays are on MacBook Pros. So this is this is sort of a if somebody's uh, disappointed with the MacBook Air because of the screen resolution, they might tend to gravitate toward this because it's brighter and sharper. Now you had mentioned Mary Jo Foley. She of course is a co-host of Twit's uh, uh, Windows Weekly, which is tomorrow at eleven. So she'll probably be talking about this uh, after the dust settles. Now one last question, Ed Bot. Going into this announcement. The rumor mill was very strong that we'd be seeing a Surface Mini, and the the uh, predictions that we'd see a Surface Pro was you know pro, a Surface Pro three was probably not. It was probably you know there were some rumors that were triggered by an accidental posting at some point, but there really was a lot of noise about a possible Surface Mini. What happened to the Surface Mini? Is this uh, is this something that's been delayed, or were the rumors just flat out wrong? Well, um, we a lot of us have been talking about that here. I don't think there's any question that Microsoft has been working on an 8-inch tablet with the Surface brand on it. But if you look at the uh, the external market today, first of all, there's a lot of successful Windows 8.1 devices in that form factor already, like the Dell Venue Pro 8. Um, and those are those are selling for $99 or $199, and they're selling really well. Um, in the category as a whole, that that uh, eight-inch segment is uh, is su starting to drop off right now. So I think there might have been a calculation in Redmond that the idea of introducing uh, into a declining market a premium-priced product is maybe this is not the right time to do that. And in fact, maybe they've just missed the opportunity to do that with the Surface line. Uh, and so they said, let's go back to our core business, business professionals who want productivity devices that basically replace desktop computers. Well, Ed Bott, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today, right fresh from the announcement, and we really appreciate your observations and insights. My pleasure, folks. See you all later. All right. Thanks, Ed Bott. You can find Ed Bott at edbott.com. That's Ed Bott with two Ts at the end. And also on Twitter at Ed Bott. Well, in a sec, we're going to talk about Apple's retail stores and the future thereof. But first, I want to tell you about Gazelle. You know you have gadgets lying around in a box, in a drawer, in the garage. Somewhere you have in your house gadgets that are worth real money. It's like leaving money in the garage, in a drawer, or around the house. And why would you do that? You can get uh, real money for your used gadgets from Gazelle. The way to do that is you just go to gazelle.com. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. And then you find your item, describe the condition, and then they'll give you a price. Now, a lot of people think that they have to have a really great, relatively new used gadget to sell to Gazelle. And that's not true. You can also send back your pretty old gadgets, your even broken gadgets sometimes, and there's no downside to do it. If you think that it's going to be difficult or complicated, you are completely mistaken because it's super easy. You don't even have to lick a stamp. You don't have to address uh, a box. You don't even have to find a box. They will send you a free box. They send you a free box with a sticker inside. You put that on the outside. It's self-addressed. And off it goes, and you get real money. They'll pay you fast by check, PayPal, or the best option, in my opinion, the one that I use, is an Amazon gift card because that'll get you 5% more money. Payment is fast, and it's risk-free, too, on multiple levels. Offers good for 30 days, so once they give you a price, you can uh, do what I did and kind of wait for three, three and a half weeks before you send your device in, and they'll honor that price, even if the actual value of that product has declined in the meantime. So that's why you want to go right now 
to lock in prices, even if you're planning on doing this later. You want to do that today because the prices, of course, are always going down. It's also risk-free in the sense that they'll wipe your data. So if you happen to have any personal information on there, maybe you're not an expert at, uh, at fully uh, erasing everything on your device. They are. Gazelle is an expert at that, and they will completely wipe all the data so it can't be retrieved by anyone at any point, and so your data is secured. So find out what your Apple or Android device is worth. Take a minute, go to gazelle.com, and find out. Do it now because your device may lose value the longer you wait. Well, Apple retail stores are the most profitable on the planet, bringing in more revenue per square foot even than Tiffany's jewelry store in New York City, and they sell diamonds. The success of the Apple Store can be attributed to a man named Ron Johnson. But after launching, growing, and running the Apple Store concept for over a decade, he left Apple three years ago to become, of all things, the CEO of JCPenney. It took Apple all this time to find what CEO Tim Cook believes is the right man for a, the job, and that is a woman named Angela Arentz, who's been in charge of Apple's retail store for three weeks. 9 to 5 Max, Mark Gurman posted a detailed feature about Arentz yesterday, and he's here to tell us all about it. Welcome, Mark Gurman. Hi, thanks for having me once again. So glad you're here. Now, before we talk about Angela Rents, can you first talk about the impact that Ron Johnson had on Apple? Yeah, Ron Johnson's impact on Apple was incredible. Um, over a decade ago, he worked closely with Steve Jobs to create the Apple Retail concept. And Apple Retail, starting with the first stores in Glendale, California, and in Tyson Square in Virginia, really put Apple on the map, put Apple into cities so people could experience the Apple product, the Apple brand. It really put the iPhone, the iPad, and the iPod on the map. So Ron Johnson was really in charge of that. And when he went to JCPenney just a couple months before Steve Jobs passed away in late 2011, it was a really big loss for Apple. And the interesting part is that it's taken Apple about three years to find a true replacement. Basically, in early 2012, Apple hired John Browett, who is the uh, chief executive officer of Dixon's in the UK, which is basically what someone in the US could consider comparable to a Best Buy store. And he was really a failure for Apple. He was fired after about six or seven months. And um, it was another loss for Apple. And Apple spent another year looking for, for another replacement. And uh, Tim Cook landed on Angela Arentz, who was the uh, CEO of Burberry. So can you tell us more about Arendt's background besides Burberry? I mean, wh where does she come from? Um, well, for the last five or so years, she, she really made herself known at Burberry. Uh, she worked at Liz Claiborne uh, in an earlier part of her life. But she's really known for her success at Burberry. Burberry was at a point where sales were slowing, product growth was slowing, product design was slowing. And essentially what Arendt's did was she was able to come in there and really revamp sales operations both online and offline using technology. And she even partnered with Apple to use iPads in some stores as tools for customers to look at uh, new Burberry products. And Burberry over the last few years have been has been growing consistently. And you know the interesting thing about her position at Burberry is that it's really reminiscent of what Apple has going on right now. Apple um, arguably is mostly you know driven by CEO Tim Cook, but he's closely working with Johnny Ive, who runs all design. Same story at Burberry. Angela really ran um, sales, the operational side, but there was a designer named uh, Christopher Bailey, who is now the CEO, who was really the design visionary. So Angela Arendt has the skill to work with someone like Johnny Ive and Tim Cook and the other Apple executives to move Apple forward in the retail space. Now, you wrote in your feature that Arendt's plans are focused on three things, which are China, that makes a lot of sense, a gigantic market, mobile payments, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, mobile payments are really the future of you know, everything for pretty much all retailers and also a quote revamped experience. Now, yes. why does she believe that the Apple store needs to experience needs to be revamped? I mean, it's, it's already pretty great. I mean, they're obviously very successful, right? The Apple store is extremely successful, but the thing is the way Apple stores function, the way consumers experience the store has really stagnated. It's really been the same for the past half decade to, to a decade. And when Apple hired John Browett, what they really were doing is they were setting themselves up for another decade or, or more, depending on how, Brow, how long Browett would have lasted there in an ideal scenario, to be more of the same, to continue what Ron Johnson and Steve Jobs created. 
Apple over the next 10 years is going to be moving into new devices. They're moving into fashion. They're buying Beats. They're working on wearable devices. They're working on new tablets, lots and lots of new mobile devices. They're not in the era of desktops and laptops and just phones anymore. So it would behoove them to find someone with the experience for selling mobile products and fashion products and growing companies in new directions. And there's nobody better than Angela Rents based on her experiences at Burberry and before that. Now, you wrote that Apple's planning to triple the number of retail stores in China from 10 to 30 over the next two years, which is a, obviously a very aggressive schedule. Why yes. do they think that, uh, that so many more retail stores in China are the key to the company's future growth? I mean, I think the, 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 the general consensus is that China is a big market, but it's a, a market that's very price sensitive, not one that, uh, that can, can find a lot of people who will pay the relatively high prices for Apple products. Right. Uh, Chinese consumers have really shown a dedication to Apple products and the Apple brand. I can't name another country where the lines for new iPhones and iPads have yielded people egging, throwing eggs at the glass windows of, of Apple stores. Um, so there's clearly demand for the Apple products there. But what Arendt wants to do with China is much more than just tripling the amount of stores to 30. It's more about bringing the appeal of Apple to Chinese consumers all over the entire world. So we'll see perhaps new architecture, new marketing that could really appeal to the uh, growing uh, cons uh, Chinese consumer base, not only in China, but across the globe. And she's also showing that dedication by changing up the leadership brass of the Apple retail space a bit. So she has Denny Tuza, who's head of China retail for Apple. He has been promoted to a larger role, and he's going to work directly with the rents. So I have a, a quick question in here, too. You know, I'm just wondering, sure. does she, you know, from her past um, with Burberry, did did she do anything in China previously? Um, her belief yeah. on China at Burberry was the same, that the Chinese oh. consumers in China is extremely important markets for the products that she was retailing, not only regionally in, in China, where it is on the globe, Chinese consumers in China, but Chinese consumers traveling across the entire world. So her belief hasn't really changed. But I guess that the Apple brand for the Chinese consumer is even stronger than Burberry based on what we've seen in terms of sales growth, the new China mobile deal from earlier this year, the, you know, just looking at people and the lines for these Apple products in China. It, it, there's a lot of evidence that her belief is going to match really well with uh, what Apple has going on for the Chinese consumers. She also has a pretty interesting TED talk about uh, energy and how energy can be harnessed uh, to sort of uh, make a lot of money for corporations or something like that. It was a very Steve Jobsian kind of concept, I thought, uh, and certainly interesting to listen to. And, you, and your feature was extremely interesting. Everybody should go read it, Mark Gurman. And I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today. Thanks a lot. Much appreciated. See you soon. All right. You can find Mark Gurman's endless scoops at 9to5mac.com and also on Twitter at Mark Gurman, G-U-R-M-A-N. Well, Google's taking its acquisition of photography to the next level with a free new feature called Google Plus Stories. The feature automatically identifies the best pictures, uh, figures out which are part of a single trip or event, and then it creates an interactive photo album for you to share on Google Plus, and you don't have to do anything. You don't even have to upload your photos because, of course, Google will do that automatically. Katie Barrett is the deputy reviews editor at Recode and also a senior reviewer there, and she joins us here today. Welcome, Kathy, Katie Barrett. Hi, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. So does this work like Auto Awesome? Does it just grab the photos and videos that you already automatically back up and just uh, make, them, make these stories, as they call them, from those pictures already present? Yes. So uh, you were correct in saying that you don't have to do a lot of work, but you will have to set your phone or other device to automatically upload to Google Plus if you haven't done so already. I wrote last week about how you can make room on your iPhone because a lot of people have issues uh, with iPhones running out of storage. And one suggestion I made was to back up your photos to Google Plus. You can do that by downloading the Google Plus app and just going into settings and automatically setting your phone to back up to Google Plus and storing your photos there. Once they are there, Google uses all of its knowledge that it has on you uh, through various means, including location history, if you've enabled that in Maps or things like Google Now. Uh, it also studies where you are and uh, your behavior. So say I left where I live, I've told Google Maps where my home is. It, 
say I leave where I usually hang out or spend most of my time, it can tell that I've left and it can tell that I've taken maybe 25 pictures at a time in a different location. And that's something remarkable. So they kind of use their different location sensibilities and give your particular story a name. Uh, for example, a trip to Washington State or whatever, not Washington, D.C., where I live. And it would include all of these photos, including a cover photo, which really looks beautiful. It kind of has this Ken Burns effect to it. Uh, it adds in maps, uh, adds in, you can very easily add captions. And the software here is extremely rich. You're looking at pictures right now that are examples of what would appear on your timeline as you go through a story that was created for you. So how does it figure out which pictures, which sets of pictures should be grouped together besides just location? Yeah, I mean, it uses computer vision and machine learning, which are uh, constantly improving. It can tell what photos are the best photos or what it thinks are the best photos that have um, uh, most unique positions of people or smiles. And it uses what you mentioned earlier, auto awesome, to enhance these pictures, not all of them, but many of them are enhanced using Auto Awesome. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it is Google's automatic editing capability. So it can do things like, if you took three pictures of a family shot and uh, in one of them, dad is smiling and the other picture, grandma is smiling and the third picture, you're smiling, Auto Awesome will combine all three pictures for you into one where everyone is magically smiling. And um, it will also make little animations for you from still photos. It will uh, enhance the background colors for you. And it just makes your photos look better. So they're using that capability in the pictures themselves already. That's something Google's been doing for a little while now. But now they're pulling them into a place where you will find them in, in organized groups of stories, as they call them. Now we live Katie, I have a question real quick. I mean, how easy is it to set this up? I mean, I think that's a big question for people. Well, you, know? you don't I mean, set it. sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, the, the concept is that you have thousands of photos backed up on your computer or on your phone, and you're not doing anything with them. You know, occasionally you send them to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr. You share them with people, but not in a complete thought, not as an album or a complete event of something that you experienced and they want to use this intelligence and make a story for you so if you go to google plus right now and you have photos there they're rolling it out to everybody today uh, if you go to your home screen on google plus uh, pull down the home menu on the left side you'll see photos there you open up photos and at the top there's a tab that says more and stories is the first thing there. So if you click that, you will immediately have a backfilled group of stories that have been created for you. I pointed out in my review that this doesn't always work. It's I kind of compared it to a complex cocktail that someone else is mixing for you. You know, if they get it right, it's delicious. It's refreshing. It's pleasing. You you love it. Um, you want more. But if they get it wrong, you kind of have this very upsetting reaction like well why didn't they get this right with all the information they know about me and and they should have really gotten it right the first time you know it's it's funny this is a work in progress but uh we are very particular about our personal content and in some instances they really got it wrong for me i'll give you an example uh, they put together a span of um like four different states and trips that i had been on that had nothing to do with one another and called it trip to Pennsylvania and Maryland. It, it was just completely out of the blue. Two of those events during that particular story happened in Pennsylvania and Maryland, but the other, uh, the other two, and there were actually additional events, had nothing to do with either of those states. And so that was a big miss. It was kind of them trying to glom together things that did not have anything to do with one another. Uh, just to be clear, this uh, it, it will allow you to edit the stories that it creates and also right. and so you can make little tweaks if you want and it won't publish them to the public or to anyone else you have to do that explicitly it'll keep them private uh just for you and and just just to clarify the question that maggie reardon had 
it's so easy to use that it's probably already done these for you. <laughs> it's our, probably already happened if you have for any pictures on Google+. Plus. I will add, but how, yes. How, how easy is it to just have it start auto-backing up things, right? Because I always find that um, just getting started on a lot of these things can just be daunting for a lot of people where it's like, oh, I'll do it later. I don't feel like figuring that out and fiddling with it yeah. for even if it takes totally 10 minutes. That's too long yes. for me. I'm too busy. Yes, I totally agree with you, Maggie. I wrote an entire column last week just about backing up photos from your iPhone, which is one example here. You know, you could have an Android phone, you could have a Windows phone, uh, you could have another device, but you need a, a place to put these photos to get them off and make more room And in a lot of cases. So uh, in the case of Google+, Plus, it's as simple as downloading the app and going into settings, and it's literally two clicks. You open settings and choose photo backup and turn it on. And that way, all of your pictures are automatically stored in Google Plus privately. They are not seen by other people. I think a lot of people, when they hear the word Google Plus, they think of a social network where everything will be spread around without my knowledge and it's nerve wracking, but this is all by default private. And these stories are also private by default. So you won't be getting anyone seeing stories about your you know, child's birth or your uncle's uh, birthday or anything else so it's all private only seen by you by default and and one last question we live in a world where everybody copies everything especially in the social space if anybody rolls out anything cool they all've got everybody's got it within a few months is there anything else out there like this or like the complete package of Google photo stuff the auto awesome movie and all the auto awesome things is anybody building anything like this uh, sure. You know, there are a lot of companies that offer to do some sort of thing like this. Uh, my colleague, Lauren Good, just wrote about an app from Adobe that lets you use your iPad to make videos. That's really cool. Uh, it makes them look professional without you having to do a lot of work. And, uh, you know, that's a plus. There are lots of companies that want to take your photos and mush them up and turn them into a video. Uh, Facebook tried its timeline feature when it first introduced that. And I think a lot of us thought that might be something like what we see here, but it really wasn't. Uh, you know, the concept of uh, Facebook timeline was you can look back at your life and sort of see how everything is laid out, but it really has not taken as far as my friends are concerned anyway. And um, I think this concept and the ability for Google to know so much about you uh, and know what you like and what pictures might mean more to you than others. And uh, to use this very intense computer vision, which is technology that can tell what looks better, what photo might look better than something else. I think that's really valuable and very hard, actually. It's not an easy thing to get right, and they will keep working at it. Google loves those kinds of technologies that only Google can do that require massive uh, storage, massive data, uh, moving around data, and also massive algorithms that are highly sophisticated like these are. Katie Barrett, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today and telling us about Google Plus Stories. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure. All right. You can find Katie Barrett's work at recode.net, and you can find Katie on Twitter at K-A-B-S-T-E-R-728. Well, IBM announced the acquisition of an artificial intelligence company yesterday called Cognia. The Australian startup makes virtual assistance with personalities. Now, Maggie Reardon, do we want uh, more Siri-like uh, products? I mean, personally, I tend to be pretty bullish on these things, but do you think that this is a good move for, for IBM? Well, I think, you know, IBM has done a lot of work, you know, um, in artificial intelligence, and that's just kind of where things are going. So, you know, they've actually been pretty leading edge. You know, you remember Watson and the whole, um, you know, uh, what was it? What was that show? Blank Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Right. Exactly. You know, so, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think this is a, a place where, where they should be. And, you know, they're even saying that, that some of that technology is helping researchers find, um, you know, help diagnose problems and, and uh, in medical issues and stuff and being used in treatments like, you know, treatment for cancer and stuff. So I think there is room for it somewhere. It's just, you know, I don't know, um, like I never really used Siri when I had an iPhone and, and I don't really use, um, you know, 
any of these other voice activated services all that often, to be perfectly honest with you, just because sometimes I get so frustrated, it's just easier to type it in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, of course, this is being folded into the Watson group. So there's a possibility that this will actually be the face and the voice and the personality of Watson. I'm sure it'll also phrase answers in the form of a question, you know, where can I find some good pizza? Uh, what is Pizza <laughs> Hut? You know, it's like, who needs that? Right. Uh, Cogni, of course, uh, has existing customers, and these include NASA and also HP and State Farm. So this is something that's currently being used for uh, applications for companies to present a personality and a face to their various services and to take complex services and make them simple. Most of the virtual assistants that we've seen so far for the consumer marketplace. So this is an interesting move for IBM. And they really seem to be investing a lot in the Watson and the artificial intelligence spaces. So it'll be exciting to see where this goes. Yeah, well, definitely. <laughs> well, China has banned, you ready for this? Windows 8, at least for employees of the Chinese government. In a bizarre announcement, the country's central government procurement center announced the ban as part of a notice on the use of energy-saving products. Their reason? Security. The announcement said it had something to do with Microsoft ending support for Windows XP. It sounds to me like they were, you know, ch the Chinese government is a Windows XP fanboy and they, they just, is payback time. What do you think, Maggie Reardon? I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. But, you know, I think, um, you know, XP is the one that you really have to be concerned about now, right? <laughs> I right. mean, that's where all the security flaws are today. So, yeah, I mean, it seems, seems kind of strange. I don't know what the link there is. Uh, but, um, yeah, maybe they're trying to pressure uh, Microsoft into supporting XP again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I think the implication here is that since Microsoft stopped supporting Windows XP, they're concerned that uh, because the Chinese government and because all governments are such laggards about upgrading their software, they're concerned that in 15 years, Microsoft will stop supporting Windows 8 or something like that. That's That's my guess. Or they're just mad. Whatever. I don't think Microsoft cares that much. There's so much piracy, uh, including among the Chinese government within China. Steve Ballmer said in 2011 that Microsoft earned less revenue in China than in the Netherlands, which is a, a country, you know, a tiny fraction of the size of China, China. And of course, that's because of piracy. So no big loss, I guess. Uh, they're not going to use Windows 8 in the Chinese government. Well, we told you yesterday about a report in the Korea Times that says, Apple and Samsung have agreed to begin talks to settle their patent disputes out of court. Sounds all warm and fuzzy, right? Well, today we're hearing about a new court filing by Apple complaining bitterly about Samsung. For example, Apple says Samsung's head lawyer called Apple a jihadist to the media and described the Apple-Samsung patent case as, quote, Apple's Vietnam. Wow. Apple also mentioned a Vanity Fair article that says the company says... Uh, that Samsung steals other companies' ideas. That proves that. And uh, so, you know, a lot of nasty rancor there. We thought it was all going to be kumbaya between Apple and Samsung. Not so fast. They're still going at it to everybody's chagrin. Well, that's the tech news today. Maggie Reardon, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Where can people find your work? Uh, they can go to cnetnews.com, and my stuff is there. I also write a column, Ask Maggie, also on CNET. So you can come to the site and find me. And I'm on Twitter, Maggie underscore Reardon. And uh, I usually post most of my stories there too. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks again. So we want you to subscribe to Tech News Today. You do that by going to twit.tv slash TNT and just clicking on the down menu. You'll see lots of options. You can subscribe in any way you like. You can also subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash Tech News Today. And join our Google Plus community and circle our page by ser searching Tech News Today on Google Plus. Tech News Today is your technology news show, and we want to hear from you. So comment on Twitter or Google Plus using the ha hashtag Tech News Today, and we'll find it. You can also send an email to tnt at twit.tv. I read those every day. Or leave us voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific, tonight and every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. See you tomorrow.